Hello, St. Mary Magdalene family and anybody else joining us from elsewhere on the internet. Uh, welcome to day two of our Holy Week retreat, uh, Holy Monday. And our theme again is Waymaker. And um, just want us to begin with prayer. And as usual, you know, I like to begin with a song. And I want to pick up where we left off yesterday with the Waymaker song. So we begin with that song, and I just want us to think about the, the lyrics about uh, our Lord is here, moving in our midst, working in this place, touching every heart, healing every heart, turning our lives around, and that he is the way maker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness. My God, that is who you are. And this is an invitation to, to come to know God in a deeper way, that we get to know these aspects of God that he be a way maker for us personally, a miracle worker in our lives, and, and learn to, to understand how well he keeps his promises to us, promises that he made to us years and years ago. So let's go ahead and begin with uh, our prayer and, and singing this song.
Father, we just praise you and thank you this day. We thank you for the many ways that you are leading us and guiding us. We thank you, Lord, for the way that you are with us on this retreat, the way that you are moving in our midst, Lord, the way you are working in our hearts and our minds. We invite you, Lord, to touch our hearts, to heal our hearts, and help us to transform our lives. We offer up to you all the struggles that we have, all the doubts we may be experiencing, all the despair. And we just invite you, Lord, to be our way maker. Make a way for us. <clears throat> Lord, be a light in the darkness for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to begin today with talking about Holy Week and where Jesus is right now. So there's a little bit of discrepancy in terms of uh, where Jesus is, what's doing, what Jesus is doing right now in the Gospels. Uh, but I'm going to go with Mark's Gospel. In Mark's Gospel... Uh, Jesus comes into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday. And so everybody's singing Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna and uh, to the King of David. And this is a traditional song reserved for a triumphant king coming into the city. And so Jesus has just, you know, finished raising Lazarus from the dead. A number of people have heard about it. A lot of people are excited about it. And they, they think that this is what Jesus is going to do. You know that he's going to throw out the Romans, and uh, this is their their time. Jesus goes into the temple on Sunday, and he prays for a little bit. And according to Mark's gospel, he goes home because it was already very late. And we're not home, but he goes to Bethany, which is where he's staying. He's staying with uh, Lazarus, Mary, Martha, and, and their family. And on Monday, so today, Monday, Jesus gets up and he goes to Jerusalem again, in, back into the city. And this time he goes to the temple. And if you look at verses, uh, Mark chapter 11, verses 15 and 19, we have the story of Jesus cleansing the temple, where he goes in and he begins to overturn the tables and the money changers and throw people out. And he's really, really upset. And so, uh, and that, that's really beautiful for us. So Jesus comes to the temple. He says, the Father's house to pray and to teach. And he finds it overrun with, with money lenders and hypocrisy and everything else. And the, and the gospel says he began to drive out those selling and buying there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. He did not permit anyone to carry anything through the temple area. Then he thought, then he taught them saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples, but you have made it into a den of thieves. And this is a powerful statement by Jesus uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, he is claiming his authority as a son of the Father. He's claiming his authority to cleanse this temple. And, and it's interesting because in, in one sense, this is a tradition that's been going on for a long, long time. Uh, and you might be wondering, well, what is a money changer? What is this? What is all this that's going on uh, right now in, in the temple? Well, the temple authorities, so, you know, the, the high priest and everybody else, they had their own money. The, the Jews had their own money that was only used in the temple. And at the time, they were being occupied by the Romans and prior to that by the Greeks. And, you know, and so they've been conquered many times. And so by this point, they developed a system that whoever, uh, whoever's money they're using, so in this case it would be Roman denarii, um, then that's what they used. But, but they would come into the temple and into the outer areas. They would come in to the temple and they would change their money to temple money, right? And using that temple money, they could then use that money to buy doves or lambs or, or other things necessary for making a sacrifice. So let's say maybe you or I are traveling from far, far away. We're coming to Jerusalem. We want to offer ourselves, uh, make a, a sacrificial offering to God. And while, well, you know, you're traveling far, far away, you're going to travel light. You know, what are we going to offer for our sacrifice? Well, we'll, we'll wait till we get there. We'll buy it when we get there. 
it's almost like if you're traveling for Christmas and you want to bring gifts, like, you know what, we'll get there a day earlier, then we'll go to the stores and buy something before, you know, so we don't have to bring it with us. So this is the idea. So the, the people are coming and going, they're used to doing this. But what happens is you end up with a marketplace mentality. And there are people who are not giving the right amount of change, who are, who are using false scales and, and different things to be able to get more money or to cheat people and things like that. And, and so the, the temple has become more of a marketplace than a place of prayer. And Jesus comes in here and he is righteously angered by what he sees because so he sees people more concerned about the money changing, more concerned about making a profit or what have you than about the true purpose of the temple, which is a place of prayer and sacrifice. And so Jesus comes in ready to make a change. What does that mean for us? Uh, well, for us, it's really interesting because Jesus has this great passionate desire to change what is going on. He, he sees the sin. He sees the errors. He sees the way people are being mistreated and, and, and treated poorly. And he wants to do something about it. And he chooses to do something about it. And, and this is where I think a, a scripture verse that, that might be helpful for us is also from Isaiah. Uh, in the from prophet Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18, Isaiah says, or the Lord says, The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. And that's a beautiful verse when you, when you think about it. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. So we're talking about God's longing here. The longing of God is to raise us up. The longing of God is to transform our hearts. The longing of God is to, to bless us, right? And so when we think about that, uh, what, we, what we really want to do is, is focus on how does that relate to the cleansing of the temple? Well, when you go back to yesterday, for example, with Moses, God tells Moses, I have heard the cry of my people. I've heard their suffering and I've come down to do something about it. The same thing here with Isaiah chapter 30. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. So God knows what he wants for us. And now he is acting. Now he is doing something. He is the way maker. And he wants to make a way for us forward in our lives. A way for us to grow in holiness, to grow in virtue, to grow in goodness, to take us out of our sin, take us out of our suffering. But here's the, the, the difficult part perhaps for us is that we are the temple. Think about that. Remember, you know, um, Paul in his letters talks about we being like temples. Uh, Peter, uh, in the first letter, Peter says, build yourselves up as living stones, right, into uh, a holy uh, temple. And so we're, we're, we are God's temple. We are the, where the Holy Spirit comes and dwells. By virtue of our baptism, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within us. We are sons and daughters of God. And because of that, we have a sacred purpose. We have a sacred purpose as being his children, right? To give glory, honor, and praise to our God and to make his presence known everywhere we go, right? So you and I basically are walking, talking billboards, uh, temples of the Holy Spirit. And people should be able to look at us and say, there goes a child of God. Right. Uh, and, and they know that by the way we act, by the way we speak, by the way we treat each other, uh, not just by the prayers we pray and, and other nice feelings sort of thing. And so that, that's where we're, we're challenged. And so when Jesus comes into the temple, he's coming into a holy place, a sacred place, and he recognizes out of his desire to honor the Father, but also to honor us, to honor the people who are there. Right. To call them forth into what the way they're supposed to be living, he begins to clean house kind of thing. He begins to throw out the money changers, overturn the tables, throw things around, you know, and and he does so righteously because he's not just. You notice he's not throwing people out. Okay, he's not going up to the merchants themselves and the people changing the money themselves, the people who are engaged in the process. He's not condemning them and casting them out. 
He's taking their stuff and throwing their stuff out. And at the same time, calling them to a repentance, to a transformation, right? To a new life, which means sacrifice, right? Because they, they can no longer do this. And this is why I say for this Monday for us, the cleansing of the temple is powerful because Jesus is coming to us as temples. And as much as we want to say, oh, Lord, make a way for me. Oh, Lord, be my way maker, my light in the darkness. You know, bless me here, there and everywhere. What we have to be willing to accept is that perhaps one of the ways that God wants to bless us is to take us out of our own slavery to sin. The sin, not that other people are subjecting us to, but to the ones that we choose. And that's the difficulty right now, I think, with, with where Jesus is. That my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples. That we are meant to be a place where God is glorified. And that people can go and encounter God in the temple. They can encounter God through us, through our actions, through our words, right? Through our, through our habits. And this is where, when we talk about living in sin, it's one thing to be let set free. It's another thing to go back. And if, again, if we go back to Exodus, what happened? You know, they, they, they leave Egypt, they cross the Red Sea, and they're in the desert. They're on their way to the mountain of God, Mount Zion. And yet people are grumbling pretty much the whole way. And some of the people grumbling are saying, let's go back to Egypt. Wasn't it better there for us? At least we had food, we had drink, we had shelter, we had all these other things. And when it comes to growing in the Christian life and maturing as, as faithful disciples, we have to come to grips with, with our old self and the self that God is calling us to. Are we going to be content and complacent with our preferred sins? You know, like, yeah, I may not be going around shooting people and killing people and stealing and things like that, but I'm doing other sins that are a bit more socially acceptable. You know, I'm drinking too much. I'm cursing a little too much. I'm maybe a little too uh, violent uh, at times and, and flipping people off or things where I downright uh, sinful in, in the way I treat others, you know, treating my family members, treating my children, treating others, you know. And yet at the same time, we have this attitude, we can have this attitude of, well, everybody else is doing it, right? Or that's just the way I am. And that's one of the saddest things I hear is that's just the way I am. That's the way I've always been. I've always been a hothead. I've always been quick to anger. I've always been a gossiper. I like to talk about people, things like that. And the difficulty is when you say, that's just the way I am, you're essentially telling God, no, thank you. I don't need your blessing. I don't want your help. I don't want any kind of life or plan that you might have for me because that's just the way I am, right? Because God doesn't make us, you know, into things we don't want to be, right? He calls us forth. He's designed us in a certain way and he needs us to grow into that, right? He needs us to grow up just like, like children need to grow in order to become adults, right? We need to be able to grow spiritually. We need to mature spiritually. And part of that maturation process is not just giving up the big obvious sins, but also inviting God into the parts of our heart that maybe we don't want to, anybody else to know about, we don't want God to know about. That that's, that's where we're asking him to come and cleanse our hearts, Lord. Come and cleanse out our pride. Come and cleanse us of our, our gossip, come and cleanse us of our, of our weakness, of our negativity, uh, of whatever it has to, happens to be, that we allow Jesus to come in and cleanse it. Because once he cleanses it, he can then not only restore us to something more beautiful, but he can actually fill us uh, with something wonderful. You know, when Jesus comes to dwell in our hearts, we give him that authority, we give him the opportunity to come into our lives and to make space for him and for himself. So I don't know if you've ever moved into another place before, but when you move into some place, a new new house, a new apartment, new whatever, you bring your stuff, right? You bring your stuff. And if there's a bunch of stuff already there, there's less, less stuff for you to, to take care of. And so you probably have to get rid of stuff in order to have room for new stuff. And so 
our hearts are very much the same way. We we can we can say, Lord, I want you to be my may, way maker. I want you to come and and transform my life. But when doing so, we are also saying, Lord, I want you to get rid of the things in my life that shouldn't be there. Get rid of the bad habits. Get rid of the the stinking thinking, as Father Will likes to say. Um, and renew in me a righteous spirit, right? Renew in me your Holy Spirit so that I can be better. And grant me your grace to be able to do that. And, and we have to be willing to let that go, right? We have to be willing to let go of our preferred sins. Uh, we have to be willing, especially to let go of our pride and our quickness to be upset, our quickness to be offended by other people and, and allow Jesus to do that. So as we continue to walk forward this Holy Week, I want us to think about those scripture verses of God saying, I, I have heard your cry. How many times have you cried about problems in your life or patterns in your life uh, that need correction, that need changing? And yet, how often do we fall back into that same rut, that same habit? And in the Isaiah 30 verse, it says, he longs to be gracious to us, and so he will rise up. And so that is what we're, we're waiting for this week, is for God to rise up. Just as it was unexpected for the people that were there that day to, to experience Jesus' presence in a way that is, they're not used to, in a way that even we are not used to. We're used to thinking of Jesus being kind and gentle and caring and forgiving, and we're not used to seeing this Jesus who is casting out uh, all the, 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 the evil and the sin from the temple. But that's exactly the kind of Jesus we need to encounter today that we need to walk with this Holy Week. So as we end tonight, I want us to go back to this understanding that God is our way maker. He makes a way in the darkness. He wake, makes a way in the wilderness. And he makes a way in us. Many times we, we like to think about this as something that happens outside of me. Uh, kind of like when we, we pray the Our Father, we pray, Lord, your kingdom come, your will be done. And But the thinking many times is out there somewhere in that person's life, in my job situation, or these other people's relationships or attitudes. But what we really should be praying is, Lord, let your kingdom come, let your will be done in me and that is the invitation that we have with this this day of the cleansing of the temple that we are the temple and that we ask god to come into our lives and to cleanse us so for your homework uh, today is to spend some time thinking about these questions you can share them with friends or a small group or just you know pray with them yourself uh, and the questions are what behaviors, attitudes, or habits do I allow to keep me from living as a temple of the Holy Spirit? What behaviors, attitudes, or habits do I allow to keep me from living as a temple of the Holy Spirit? And I think it's important to say the word allow because we are in control. One of the marks of growing maturity is to take responsibility for our actions. I know as, as children when we grow up, and I know my children did this all the time, and some of them still do, uh, they place the blame on other per people. You know, so-and-so made me do this, or I, you made me do that. And as we mature, we have to grow past that, and we have to be able to own our re own responsibility. That no matter what temptations there were, no matter what pressures there were, that we ultimately have that deciding vote in our will, in our mind, in our heart, to choose or not to choose. And so that is where we have to make that, that decision. So let's ask that question, what behaviors, attitudes, or habits do I allow to keep me from living as a temple of the Holy Spirit? The next one is similar. That is, where do I need God's holy cleansing in me? And maybe it's been a long time since you've been in confession, or maybe there's a, a habitual sin that you have where do you need God to come with his power to, to cleanse that from you? And the last question is, what ways do I deny God the opportunity to act in my life 
because of my unwillingness to change? What ways do I deny God the opportunity to act in my life because of my unwillingness to change? And again, this is about taking responsibility for our actions, taking responsibility for ourselves, in that many times, if we're really truly honest, the real reason why we don't change is perhaps we don't want to. And even the attitude that we spoke of earlier, of that that's just the way I am, is a way of denying God uh, God's right to be able to bless us. God made us in a certain way, and, and even with our faults and failings and, and weaknesses, he knows that, and he compensates for that in his call and in his blessings and in his grace for us. But when we say that that's just the way I am, we're essentially saying, God, you don't know what you're doing. Your plan doesn't work. So that's what this question, in a sense, is getting at. What are the ways that I deny God the opportunity to act in my life because of my unwillingness to change. And spend some time on that one and, and really bring that to the Lord. So um, the other recommendations I had last time, take a, do some journaling and everything else. Uh, surround yourself with script, Christian music or with uplifting scripture quotes. All that sort of stuff that I said last time applies today too, that you continue to do these things. And... Uh, Let's go ahead and end with a prayer and with a final song. And the song will be about uh, asking God to cleanse our hearts, uh, to create in us clean hearts. So we pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for the way that you have called us, the way you lead us and guide us. We offer you our lives, Lord. We offer you our stubbornness. We offer you our, our sinfulness, our, our habits, our thought life, our, our, our habits with, with screens and, and with people. We ask you, Lord, to cleanse us. Cleanse us with your holy power. We know that, that you are loving and compassionate and your desire is to bless us. And that you come to us and you make ways in the, in the wilderness and in light in the darkness. And we just pray that... You light up our minds that we may see your way, we may see your will, and we may give up our doubts and our fears because of your light. We pray that you strengthen us, strengthen us to be able to accept those ways that you want to change our life for the better, but that we are perhaps too afraid to let go of, or we, we, it's been with us so long we don't know what to do. We just pray that you come with your cleansing power, and just as you cleaned out the temple from the money changers and, and the, the people who are treating it as a marketplace, you transform our lives, clean everything out that is a distraction, everything out that is not from you, everything including our own plans for ourselves, that our plans may return to you because we are yours, Lord. Help us to glorify you in our minds, in our hearts, in our words, in our actions, in our bodies that we may be living temples. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joys of thy salvation, and renew a right spirit.